Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. Would you like even more content? Here's my Patreon. Now onto the stories. Case file number 1176, written by Barbara. The three warnings that saved my life. One day, I was riding in a cab in my neighborhood, and I said to the cab driver, Look, there's a photo of a girl and flowers on that lamppost. It must be a memorial to someone who died in an accident right there. To my surprise, he said, I know that girl's family. She was 16, and she died crossing that street because the driver sped up instead of stopping. The next day, I was at a local bank, and I happened to mention the accident to a teller I knew. Again, I was surprised when she also said, I know that girl's family. They told me a confused elderly driver stepped on the gas instead of the brake. The day after that, I bought some ice cream from an ice cream truck. I noticed that the man in the truck was wearing a rubber bracelet, which people wear to support a cause or as a tribute. I asked, why are you wearing that bracelet? And he said, in honor of my daughter. Last week she died in a car accident. Yes, you guessed it, he was that girl's father. After this coincidental chain of events, I wondered if possibly fate was trying to tell me something. I concluded that the message was that I should be extra careful the next time I was about to cross the street. That time came early the next morning, when I set out to go to a yard sale. When the light turned green, although there were no cars in sight, and no other people around but me, I didn't walk forward. A car came zooming through the crosswalk and continued on without stopping. If I had been crossing at that moment, I would have been killed. Thanks to the three warnings, combining into a special message from fate, I wasn't. Case note to file 1176, The Three Warnings. So can anyone honestly chalk this up to destiny? I know tons of people in my personal life that would try to do that, and while technically possible, it's like in a casino. When you start rolling hits five times in a row, the pit manager starts to pay attention, and so we should be too, if reality starts throwing... Dice is like, those might be loaded. So all there is to say here is that, universe, we are paying attention. Something's amiss. Case file number 1177, written by Pant Fiction, The Ceiling Beast, Lawrence. A few years back, I and a friend of mine, we called him Tackle Box, went over to another friend's house, J-Bot. The living room is on the second floor and the ceiling is made of a very weak particle board like substance, flaky and painted white. On one of these ceiling tiles, there was a scrape that ended with a large hole. It sat just over where J-Bot had placed his TV. So the three of us are hanging out, watching a really bad B-rate film about giant insects on the sci-fi channel. Tackle Box glances up and says, yo, is that a spider in that hole? J-Bot and I look at him and start laughing. His obvious attempt at scaring us because we were a little high and watching the film we were watching was a complete failure. No, guys, I'm serious, he says, but there's some gravity behind his voice and expression. J-Bot and I, sitting on the floor, stare deep into the hole, looking for something resembling a spider. The hole was probably large enough to put two fists through, and I was staring at what may have been loosely hanging fabric draped lightly around the inside of it. Then suddenly, what manifested due to its movement was something resembling fingers, crooked, bent, and jointed, that scurried backward into the hole. Panicking, we found ourselves on the other side of the living room frantic for an explanation. What we saw was not a spider, and even if it was, it was larger than even a tarantula. We weren't sure what to do, so we slowly approached the hole, on foot, and I took cover behind the love seat peeking up over the back support. That's when I saw the craziest thing. It stuck something out through the hole. It was a light brown and gray, with lighter gray spots, but it resembled a periscope, but rounded and stubbier, spinning around, scanning the area. My imagination struggled with what I was seeing. My brain just couldn't come up with any explanations. I actually began to accept the fact that it was extraterrestrial, because I had nothing else. Then we grabbed a piece of cardboard and some courage, rushed to the hole, placed the cardboard over, taped it down, and then re-taped it for good measure. 
Then we named the ceiling beast Lawrence. That cardboard stayed up there for years, with warnings all over it. If anyone so much as pretended to take it down, anyone present for the initial incident would dart from the room and down the stairs, no explanation. Case note to file 1177, The Ceiling Beast Lawrence. This gives me both vibes of Stranger Things and The Mist combined. Hell, those two lores could be combined pretty easily. Maybe they are in the same universe, actually. <laughs> That'd be kinda cool. Like 40k and Event Horizon being the prequel given that they, they head into the warp zone, sort of, but they have no shielding, so it takes them over and consumes them with uh, just pure evil. It's a very interesting theory. One of the more plausible fan theories, if you ask me. You're braver than I would have been. I think in this situation, most people just set a fire and start a new life in a new country. Even if you're kids, you know, you have to just make do with what you can. <laughs> Even on another planet, if Elon Musk has uh, space on his Mars trip. Creepy file number 98, written by Anonymous, the protective beam of light. I was driving home at around midnight one night on the empty streets of my hometown when I saw a car turn onto the street that I was on. It was about 50 yards behind me or so on the two-lane road I was on, nearly two miles from my house. It hit a bump as it was turning, and its lights hit the sweet spot in my mirror where they lined up with my eyes, flashing and blinding me for an instant. As soon as this happened, I became overwhelmed by a visceral sense of dread. I knew this car was bad news, there was no question about it. Sure enough, they pulled up right beside me and everyone in the car looked at me. I remember hoping it was a bunch of drunk teens or something. What I saw was three or four young men in wife beaters with blank expressions. I turned away and continued to drive normally, deciding that I wouldn't look at them again. They kept pace with me and drove erratically, probably trying to get my attention. When I turned onto my street, they screeched tires making a turn from the outside lane to follow me. I didn't know what to do, so I turned down my driveway suddenly. They missed the turn and sped past. I turned off the lights in my car and drove up so I couldn't be seen from the road. They drove around the block a time or two before I booked it inside. I still don't know how I intuited that they were dangerous, but it sure as hell happened. Case notes are the creepy file number 98, the protective beam of light. So others suggested this, but I want to reiterate. If you're being followed by strange people or a car you perceive as hostile, the best course of action, best course of advice is finding the nearest police station or busy place of business, like a gas station if it's at night, well lit. If you can't do that, trying to shake them and hide is the next best thing, without driving recklessly, of course. Now I know people don't always think rationally in these kinds of chaotic and fearful situations, adrenaline spikes and all that, so I don't blame you at all. But leading people back to your home is suboptimal for sure, so be careful about that. As for the headlights, yeah. It's down to the manner in which they turned, and the lights were flashing. Your subconscious processed enough information from that limited input to determine with high accuracy in this case that danger was afoot. Isn't it amazing how powerful our minds are? Like outside of any sort of supernatural or deeper layer processing of future information, just the raw base level is so powerful. We are the ultimate AI, and we're trying to create it, which is interesting, and it's useful for specific cases, but I love our brains. <laughs> our brains are very cool. And now time for the quote of the day. You can't help someone up a hill without getting closer to the top yourself. H. Norman Schwarkasoff. Definitely butchered the last name there. Helping others doesn't mean that you diminish yourself. It doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice blood and become weaker. Not at all. I think by helping other people, we become stronger. And it's actually a very interesting point to make. You see a lot of creators on social media, YouTube and such, that help other people and record it. And people don't like that. I guess they think that taking credit for benevolence is bad, or that maybe because they make a profit from it and they can keep doing it, then it's somehow bad. I disagree. I think it's a win-win, win-win in every category. Like Mr. Beast. He helps so many people to such a great extent. And he's only able to do that because he records it and makes it entertaining. So tons of people watch it. And then he gets advertising money, sponsorships, and can keep doing it. Helping the world. I don't understand how anyone has a problem with that. I think it's awesome. He's helping the world push it to the top. <laughs> and yeah, he elevates himself too. It's fantastic. 
Win, 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 win. Keep on winning forever. <laughs> Good. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony signing off.